Like from a customer's perspective, you're like, I'm getting sold to, I'm getting tricked. I'm getting, you know what I mean? So him as a salesperson to very quickly and very efficiently break down that defense. Here's what he would say. He said, you don't need to, you don't need to buy today, do you? everybody my name is Devin this is my co-host Mitch Harley welcome to another installment of the perspective podcast uh today we're going to be diving into sales and this is definitely more uh Mitch's wheelhouse than it is mine um but uh hopefully I have some insights to offer because I'm definitely a student of this the world of sales so uh I guess Mitch open it up with uh you know, where, where do people start with, when it comes to sales? There's, there's so much to cover. <laughs> that's, that's a loaded question uh, in the sense that I think a lot of people don't understand what sales is. Right. Right. And they don't, a lot of people don't recognize they're in sales. Uh, for example, a restaurant, uh, the wait staff, those are salespeople. Um but nobody treats them like sales staff, especially managers and, and owners and the staff themselves don't view themselves as salespeople. But restaurant industry, yes, there's certain things that are super profitable, out of, super profitable about it, but there's a, it's also a very tight industry as well. It's super competitive. There's a ton of um, restaurants out there that you're competing with on a nightly basis. So you have to ask yourself, how do I increase revenue with only a set amount of tables and only a set amount of average turnovers on each table per night. Well, you have to increase your sale per customer. And in order to do that, you need to sell. So that's in the, that's in the restaurant world, the same with fast food. Those are your sales staff at the front, right? Those people asking, do you want to fries with that? Do you want to make it a combo? Do you want to make it a meal? That's a sale. That is somebody being a salesperson. Now, they still have to recognize that and they can get really good at it. But, you know, you can read outside of that script that those chains give you. Now, that's the food industry. You talk about uh, other industries, construction industries, sales, same thing. You are trying to persuade somebody to purchase your product or service. That is a salesperson. But if you don't view yourself as a salesperson or that role as a real salesperson, there's no success there, but that doesn't change that it still is and always will be a sales position. Right. So just if, if you don't acknowledge it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. If you pretend like you're not that thing, it doesn't mean that it's not still happening. And I think that you kind of alluded to the idea that sales is always happening. Like as an example, you and the buddies, everybody, we're all kind of gathering. We want to go out to a place. I have a place in mind. And the question comes up, hey, guys, where do you want to go? Now I'm in a sales pitch, whether or not I want to see it that way. I'm in a sales pitch because I got, oh, you know, there's this place that I went to, you know, two months ago. It was super awesome. You know, we got to go down there. It was this, it was that. And so now you're kind of like selling this idea to your friends about going to that place. And this is um, in its most purest and simplest form is like, if you want somebody to take a desired action that's where the role of sales kind of kicks in, right? I think some people are like, oh, sales, and, and they scare away. They're like, I don't want to be sold to. Yes, you do. Everyone wants to, be get, wants to get sold to. For someone's like, oh, I don't want to get sold to, then don't go to a store. Right. Right? Don't walk in. Don't phone somebody for a service because you do want to be sold to. Now, what you don't want is you don't want somebody to make you uncomfortable. And that's where there has to be a distinction. And that's the difference between a professional salesperson and a poorly trained or, yeah, for lack of a better term, poorly trained salesperson. Because even guys that have been doing it for 30 years, I see a lot of veteran salespeople that are unqualified and, and lack skills. And they argue, I've been doing this for 30 years. I made a career of it. No, you showed up to work every day. There's a difference. And so, you know, just because you've maintained some accounts that were given to you when you started, that doesn't make you a salesperson. That makes you somebody out of convenience. 
That's an account manager. A salesperson goes out and drives sales. A salesperson goes out and takes business away from his competition professionally. A salesperson goes and makes the customer feel good about the experience of buying from that person. And this goes across whether it's retail or whether it's commercial or industrial or online. Even online, you can create a good customer experience. That is not just for the people at the desk. That is not for people answering the phone to make problems. That is the salesman's job. And sometimes businesses aren't big enough to have salespeople in their own roles. So that's a, that's a really good point, right? So what do you do? Does that mean you don't do sales? No, it means that now the role of sales is on somebody else as kind of multitasking until the business is big enough. So how can you make little adjustments to keep your sales effective without losing productivity and other responsibilities that you have within the company. And that's something that a lot of businesses struggle with. And so they, they don't grow as quickly as they want because they're trying to manage everything. And it's true. You don't want to hire a marketing agency and a salesperson and a, you know, admin person when you don't have the revenue stream to support that. That's poor planning in itself. So realizing that, hey, I'm not there yet. I'm going to have to work a little harder. I got to juggle a few things around myself. That's, that's important to make that recognition. And something that I think businesses should do very early on from a sales standpoint, but also from, you know, it, it affects it in a lot of ways is creating an anchor. <coughs> and creating an anchor is, you know, that term lost leader. Right. Um, a loss leader doesn't necessarily mean a loss of, of profit or revenue. It just means a very small margin that you couldn't necessarily, you know, go buy your dream car if you only sold that. So, you know, for example, uh, a loss leader in McDonald's would be their McDouble. Um, or Anything or the, off that dollar value. Yeah, meal. Anything the dollar value. The business, Wendy's doesn't make money off a dollar junior bacon cheeseburger. But it's there for a reason, right? It's that draw. It's that anchor product. They want you to buy the Baconator. And I fall for it every time because I love it, right? But it got sold to me at some point through marketing and branding and all that. But that's not their anchor, right? That comes and goes. Their it, anchor so is their value. I'm hearing something here. Um, that is very, very familiar to, to my world, uh, you know, the marketing and the psychology and all that. And um, it's almost like the first step in any position of sales or, you know, increasing revenue in a business is by uh, focusing on that customer experience. What happens when somebody has a problem that you can solve? So how do they find you? How do they interact with your business? How do you prove to them that you're the right fit? How do you nav help them navigate the steps that it's going to take to make a purchase, whether that be a product or a service? And then from there, how can you increase the amount of value you give them while still being rewarded on the other side? And then there's like an ongoing long-term relationship. Does that sound close to you know the, the process of sales to you? It, it does. And it is. Um, but it's, that's not really what creates sustainability. That's just the mechanics of business. Right. And that's sales is kind of a default or business is a default of sales, whichever way you want to look at it. But when you look at what is my anchor and, and that anchor is both in product or service, but also in client. So when you have an anchor product, like a McDouble at McDonald's, or let's go into a different industry. Um, let's look at a company like Bootlegger, for example. What is Bootlegger's anchor? Jeans. Right. Right. Everything else in that store revolves around jeans. You go to, uh, I don't know, Nike. Shoes. Shoes. Everything around in Nike that you can buy revolves around going with your shoes. So in a sense, shoes are their lost leader 
in the sense that they don't have a 300% markup on their shoes like they do, say, on the sweatpants or the hoodie. Because you're not buying a hoodie out of necessity. You need a pair of shoes. Right. And then every once in a while, they release a special shoe that everyone lines up around the corner for. And that one obviously is more profitable, but that draw, that anticipation around that anchor is actually really smart. Not a lot of businesses do that. They don't make their anchor uh, a commodity or a, not a commodity, sorry. Most anchors are commodities. For example, in the construction world, a commodity product, you go to a Home Depot or anything like that. They're commodity anchors that they make very little margin on. Sheets of drywall, sheets of plywood, uh, two by fours, siding, like the actual right. cladding and boards. Why? Why do that? Because if you can get people in for the commodity, you know what trim, the value of trim is on any product, whether it's siding or roofing, trim and capping and starters and plug covers and plumbing stacks, those are accessories that are extremely high margin products. And while you're there, how do I put it on? Oh, I need fasteners. Rip down to the fastener aisle. And now you're at 120 profit gross margin. Right. So I heard the the old adage of uh, the lumber at Home Depot, they're basically giving it away. They're not making any money on it. Um, but when you get a sheet of drywall, you're going to need screws. You're going to need the mud. You're going to need the tape. You're going to need the, um, spatula things. You're going to need, uh, a sanding block, and then you're going to need some primer and then you're going to need some paint. And that's, you're barely even close to being finished that project because next you got to do the flooring and then you got to do the treatments and accessories. And, and so sure they can give that drywall away at cost but they're going to make a ton of profit on all of those other things. And it's the fact that they make their uh, lumber so cheap that makes them more desirable as a place to go to, as opposed to, you know, some off-brand hardware store who's the lumber is, you know, they got a 50% markup on it and it's very expensive. And then you factor in all those other things that you need. And be, just because you think you're getting a deal on the lumber, you also think you're getting a deal on all that other stuff at Home Depot when the reality is, is like that's where they're actually making all their money. So a good example of that was uh, I was just at a project where we needed rebar. The rebar at Home Depot was three times the price as the local lumber yard. But the lumber was almost three times the price at the hardware, at like the, the local store versus Home Depot. Right. So it's not across the board. Right. It's very selective. You look at tools, power tools. If you ever bought a power tool and you don't even have to be in trades to know this. Half of them are like super cheap, like good brands, super cheap. They don't come with a battery. Yeah. How much is the battery? It's the same price as the tool. <laughs> Sometimes it's even more. This is the same situation with printers. You buy a printer, it's $29.99. You buy the printer ink, also $29.99. But you got to buy that shit monthly. <laughs> it's not the same though. And here's, here's a clarification with printers, and here's an extremely good way to, that they market. When you buy a printer, you can print right away. It's ready to print. It's got ink in it, right? Do you know that the cartridges in an ink printer aren't full? Yeah, I did hear something about that. So when you buy, when you run out of ink, and you run out of it very quickly because they're only like half to a quarter full, and then you go to replace it and it's like, man, this, they're so expensive. I could buy a new printer for that. No, you could buy a half filled carton of ink with a printer. Or you could spend the money that they didn't put into that printer and it'll actually last longer. Right. right. Quality ink too. Like, I mean, cheap stuff always cheap. Right. So yeah. that's, that's the concept of a, so the, the printer itself is the anchor. They give away the mechanics. Same with vehicles. There's not a ton of markup on vehicles, but the warranty, the parts, the accessories, like that's where Ugly dealers service their yeah, money, yeah, yeah. Right? oil changes. The pro they put you in an oil change program. As soon as you buy a car, first one's free. And then the next ones give you this deal. Why? The anchor was the vehicle. So now we've created the concept of anchor uh, a product. How do we anchor a client? So another concept to come up with, and a lot of bigger companies have done this. So they, um, they find someone and they negotiate 
really good pricing that's really attractive to this client on a volume-based system. And what they, cal- what they calculate is how much do I need to run my business? Keep the doors open. I'm not talking profit, not putting food on my table. What does it take to run my business? And they find a client that will buy enough on a regular basis at, at a really low margin to, for them to be loyal, not go and shop the price out. You give them good service and they keep your doors open. That means that everything else you do with a very low maintenance anchor customer, everything else you do basically is pure profit. And that, so when you take on that second client, that third client, that fourth client, those are the money makers. But that first one is the one that supports everything in order for you to do that. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's that the value sense. of finding that anchor client. And sometimes you have to think outside of the box because not everyone's an anchor client. Not everyone you can turn around and be like, oh, they're going to buy enough to run my business for me. That's, that's not how it works. So an example of that is there was a, a company and, and they, sold, they sold vacuums. And so we were building a plan. It wasn't Kirby, and, was it? No, it wasn't Kirby. Because I worked there and they're really, really sketchy, just for the record. <laughs> no, it wasn't Kirby. But they, we started looking like, what's your anchor? And they're like, we don't really don't have one. I'm like, so you are literally relying on walk-ins, which is scary. Because yes, you have something that everyone wants, but there's a level of education needed there because you can go to home... Depot and get a vacuum. You can go to Walmart and get a vacuum. Why would they pay more to come to you? I know the answer. You don't have to justify it to me. I know you have a better quality system. I know that Walmart doesn't sell the high end stuff that lasts a long period of time. They're more focused on disposals. Same with Costco. This is why my vacuum cost me $79. (laughs) Right. Costco actually bankrupted Eureka. You you don't see them anymore. Yeah. So that's that's kind of a neat story there, but that's that's a lesson that will fall into this as well. But what we did is we said, okay, who do you service? Like who's someone that does come in, say on account for a a commercial account and they identified them. I said, what else do they do? Like, what is their business? And they said, um, Oh, they're like a mechanic shop. So they, they go through hoses and stuff because they detail. I'm like, what does a mechanic shop use? Do they use a lot of rags? Yeah. I'm like, then find a supplier on rags and sell them pallet quantities. Wow, that is actually ingenious. Right? And so it's like, yeah, it's not a vacuum-based product. It's a cleaning service. You are in the cleaning industry. Just expand your horizon a little bit. So that one adjustment now all of a sudden opened up a revenue stream for them where they didn't have to panic every month on walk-in customers. The walk-in customers were actually, you're excited to see them because they're a pure profit product now. Well, and doesn't that change the relationship that you have with that group of people now too? Because you're not in a position of scarcity and desperation. You're not constantly struggling to close and make a sale you're in the position to just comfortably serve people that need that actually genuinely need you and and this in in, in that it does you're absolutely right and what it does is it feeds really nicely into um value sale upsell system sales because now you're not selling out of desperation you're not trying to find them the cheapest product so that you can make the sale now you're saying all right, now we're in a profit mindset. Now we're in a mindset of abundance. If this person walks out the door, I don't want them to. I, I'm going to do my job and they're going to buy something, but I'm not going to take them to the lowest price product because my bills are covered. I've got my one or two or three anchored clients because you don't have to have just one. You can have a couple, right? That's, that's really smart to do. Well, and I think it actually points at uh, like an MRR model, like a monthly recurring revenue um, inside of a business by have it's almost like a subscription Th- that said company they need these rags once a month they get a whole pallet of it and that's worth x amount of dollars now every month you have a predictable income stream unless somebody you know swoops in and convinces them that their rags are better or cheaper or whatever the situation may be um, but you have something there now that's a, a, a predictable uh, income generator it and it's true and a great example of that is um, if you've ever been in the uh well, it doesn't really, it's not really an industry related. Uh, the, the, those Zep, I, Zep is a company that does it, but they do like eye washing stations and 
first aid kits and there's always like a, a box that says zap on it and there's different companies that do it but basically they're you're on a rotation so every month their their local rep comes through and he checks in and any products that you're low on he switches it out and then they just invoice you based on what they've swapped out coffee guys right the van hoot machine or you know they they come in they check your inventory level they swap it out they invoice you for what they've added and it it seems small but that's consistent. That's basically passive income. You're not having to sell over and over and over again. You make the one sale and it keeps recurring. You just got to maintain it. That's, that's almost the principle that goes into the financial industry. That's almost the principle that goes into, you know, direct marketing and, you know, MLM marketing. Same thing. You, you do it once and it reoccurs. That's how people make money in those industries. But that subscription model, that's not selective to one industry. That's, that's all over. That's creating that anchor client in a sense, because unless there's a problem, you can count on a certain amount of money. And after a period of time, you can actually look back and know what you can count on every month from that client. Right. So I, I think of it in terms of like, you know, in the agency world, there's uh, we, I guess it's called the retainer model. So you pay X amount of dollars, you get this type of service. Uh, that's what you have every single month. So as an example, in my world, um, we start with just basic social media management. So that means, okay, once a day, we got a piece of content that's going out on, you know, one or two or maybe several different platforms. um, And it's generated in a way that serves the audience of people that you're trying to attract. Uh, We make sure that the copy is written. We make sure that the graphics are designed well. They fit the brand and all that kind of stuff. We make sure it gets scheduled and it's posted. And there's, you know, a certain amount of work that is involved with that. There's certain team members that have to play a role in that. And then once it's done, it's done. And that's worth 500 bucks, let's just say as an example. So every month now, I know that if I have, you know, three or four clients that are paying that, all the bills are covered. And now anything that we do on top of that, is um, out of necessity if that customer needs it. And that's where we um, make you know our money. So let's say a client goes, hey, listen, we got a promotion that we're going to be running up uh, you know, in a couple of weeks. Can we get some extra graphics for that? And we can we put some ad spend behind that so that we can kind of drive a little bit of traffic in the door for that specific thing? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, we, we can take care of that. So what's the, what's the budget? What's this? What's this? What's this? And then we take all of that stuff, we kind of pile it on. We're already getting that $500 a month. So all this extra stuff, that's like, oh, okay, cool. Now we got some profit. Now we're turning something over and we're turning it into something that's um, you know, sustainable for the business. What's, what's really good about that is you've taken the pressure off. So whether you have a salesperson or whether you're doing that yourself as the business owner and kind of you know, wearing those multiple hats, now you've allowed yourself to have the opportunity to sell better. And this is where if you don't have something in place, like I I always go back to the value ads, right? And whatever name you call them, add on sales, value ads, system selling, it's all the same stuff. And do you want fries with that? Exactly. Right. (laughs) But if you don't have that in place at a certain point, then when you're done that anchor product and you've got it in place, your other revenue is not going to do anything. It's just going to be stagnant because now you're, it's like you make a step and you're like, good. And now you focus on the next one, but you should always be a step or header too. You may not be implementing it yet, but once you have that and you're, once you have that anchor set and then you're waiting for say your walk-ins or your cold calls and stuff like that, you need to have a system in place and you need to have those add-ons ready so that when someone calls you, you know how you're going to take that sale from here to here. You're in a restaurant. The person so, comes in, right? We've talked about the anchor being the steak and the potatoes. Your wait staff should understand first thing you offer them is the most expensive drink. That's do you what want you some do. wine with that? Do you, do you, do you, are you interested in the wine menu? How many times have you heard that? Do you buy the wine? Sometimes. I don't buy the $300 bottle, but I definitely don't buy the $2 bottle. You know what I noticed actually? This is so crazy. 7-Eleven started doing this thing and and it harkens back to my like early days as a um, a fuel exchange technician. Uh, I was going to say a Slurpee junkie. (laughs) Yeah, that too. Um, 
so when you when you go to 7-Eleven, you grab the junk that you're trying to get, you put it on the counter and you're ready to check out. And every single time I go there, I don't know if this happens to you, but all the 7-Elevens I've ever been, hey, could I interest you in any of the hot food that we have over here? And it's, you know, the hot dogs that are rolling there with the taquitos and with the pizza and whatever wings they got and all that. And like, if I wanted that stuff, obviously I'm going to ask for it. But the thing is, is, um, and I'm sure if we looked into it in some meaningful way, we would find out that uh, 7-Eleven has started doing testing where if they get their cashiers to ask you if you want some of the hot food, um, it's increased their sales by 10, 15, 20% maybe. Because 10 out of 100 people are going to go, you know what? Yeah, grab, throw a piece of pizza, throw a hot dog in there. I'm starving. I was going to wait till I got home, but who cares? I'll just eat a hot dog. So they're, they're capitalizing on that impulse buy that, you know, like I don't, it's not like they're taking money from you that you don't want to give away. You wanted it. You just needed somebody to tip you over the edge and, and make that purchase. And I remember back when I used to work at SO as a, as a gas jockey, um, we had a, like a, 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 it's an ongoing promotion. If we don't ask you, if you want a car wash, you get a free one. So it's a weird game now that the the patrons are playing with us, uh, the cashiers, because if we don't say it and they go, ah, oh, we got you, I get a free car wash. And so then we'd have to print out a receipt for the car wash and give it to them. And then off they go. And like uh, the cost on the car wash is only two dollars. So the, you know, the owner of the gas station doesn't really care. But now when I ask somebody if they want a car wash, there's a 10 or 15 percent increase in revenue for that business in general just from that sheer act of me asking, because maybe somebody wasn't thinking about it or their minds distracted or whatever million other reasons. So that's really crazy. Now it's actually like hear it from somebody who's been in this world for a while, that there's something Petrican. else kind of going on back there. Petra can they're required as part of their job to offer three add on sales per transaction. That's a lot. That is. It's a lot of questions. I'm like, no, thanks. No, thanks. No, thanks. Like, <laughs> it's not, an but it easy doesn't stop me do. from going to Petro Canada. That's no, but as, as the cashier, it takes, it takes something to achieve that because on top of that, you also are required to ask them if they have Petro points. And if they say no, would you like to sign up? Then right. on top of that, you got to find three add on sales. They can be anything in the store, but you have to ask. So, what I did was find the three most easy, cheap, most convenient things. And at the end of your shift, your add-on sales, they, they show up. And you oh, actually shit. write down how many you did. Right? So you have to offer something that is on promotion through Petrocan. And then you have to offer, uh, you can offer something else, but it tracks the promotion items. So when they offer you a two for $5 washer fluid, when someone says yes, it tallies it up on your report that prints out at the end of your shift on your till. Right. When they ask you, you buy a single monster energy drink and they're on two for five. You know, those are on two for five. Do you want, do you want me just to ring you up and you can grab one on your way out? Yeah, sure. People that buy monsters, they're going to buy another one. Like nobody ever turned that down. Nobody's like, <laughs> oh, you know what? Holes. No, one monster is enough for me. They're buying a monster. They don't care. Yeah. Right. Um, so there, there was lots of that happening. You could always offer upsell. But for people running their own business, you have to know what your add-ons are. You have to know what kind of systems you can offer. The, the vacuum place, for example, tons of accessories. Do you know that if your vacuum breaks down, it usually costs you like 50, 60 bucks and you can get it up and running for another year. But they had to educate. They loved selling vacuums with bags. Why? Because they sold bags. They get sell more and bags. People would come back for bags, hose repair, all these things. But I was like, when you sell it, you have to educate the people. You have to educate your clients so that they'll come back to you. That's part of your add-on sale. Okay, so I got a question then for you because this is... Um... I remember my experience when I was younger and kind of like just put in this position to be doing these sales. It's kind of awkward. It's kind of weird. It's kind of hard. It, kind of, it feels like, oh, you know, I don't want to be out here trying to trick people into buying things. So I don't know. I'd love to kind of dig into um, the psychology of being a salesperson and how to do it 
uh, first of all, effectively, because if you're not an effective salesperson, you're, you're not making any money. Secondly, um, do it in a way that's beneficial, kind of a win-win situation for, for both parties, both me, the salesperson, and then, you know, the person on the other side of it, that's kind of, uh, at the mercy of, of what I'm cooking up for them. <laughs> so let's, let's look at a retail situation here. Uh, let's go to Best Buy. We're all going to take on a trip to Best Buy and we're going to buy a laptop. Our mission, we're gonna buy a laptop. I'm not sh- I'm not window shopping. I'm going to buy a laptop. I know that when I pick out my laptop, I probably know what I want already or very close to it. I just need to know if there's anything that I missed so that I can make the correct purchase. So very rarely do people, especially now, go to buy a laptop or a phone or some key item or even a TV and know nothing like very rarely we have a lot of access to information literally at our fingertips but if you work at a place like best buy and you can apply this to anything you take it to any retail uh, i have one more example after best buy but you take it and you apply it to your your situation you don't have to sell someone a tv what do you sell them if they're buying a tv you buy them a sound system Right? Because what do they need with the TV? They need a sound system. Okay, so don't focus on the TV. You focus on pairing it. Because chances are, if they're spending the money on a TV, they also want to upgrade their sound system for whatever reason. So back to the laptop, they already know there's probably only two or three laptops that fit their needs. And so they just need you to help them make that decision. But once that decision is made, if that person walks out of that store with just a laptop, your salespeople did not do their job. Right. I want, and this, the reason I say this is because it happened to me. I did it as an experiment. I was buying a laptop. I knew that I was buying a very expensive laptop. It was a touch screen, the fold around, like you name it. It was all in, right? There's a reason it doesn't come with a screen protector, a wireless mouse, a bag, all these other items, a printer. It doesn't come with the laptop. But what made me inside mad, and I couldn't get mad at the person because they obviously didn't have training, but they set me up with the perfect laptop that was right for me. And then they brought me to the till and they rang me up and they said, is that everything? No, (laughs) it's not. And now we're in this awkward situation because you've already rang me up at the till. I want a bag. I want a screen protector and I want a mouse. Oh, those are questions. I was, I'm going to buy those items. So asking me at the time when I picked that laptop and put it in my hand, that's when you ask. You're not saying you have to buy it. You're offering. And you know what? Some people are going to say, no, I already got a bag. I already got a mouse. It's all good. I'll transfer it over. Me, 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 me. Okay. But a lot of people need a full setup. So you're buying, well, especially a if you're spending two thousand dollars on a computer, like a decent computer. What's another twenty or thirty dollars for a you know a nice little bag for it to go in? That's new, you know what I mean? Because we all got old bags, but I just got a new computer. I want to feel special, so having a newer bag would make it feel special. So this actually points at having a genuine um, concern for the person that you're serving. I think starting with the idea that, hey, listen, I'm here. I'm in this position because. People need help. Sometimes these worlds are a little bit complex. Like computers, very, very complex. Ask the average Joe if they have any idea what CPU or RAM or, uh, you know, core processors. Are. Like nobody is really going to know this stuff. So being like, okay, what are you using it for? What's your objective here? What is it that you're trying to get to? And so you, you get into that uh, genuinely curious about them kind of lane of questioning. Okay, so what are you using the computer for? Okay, cool. Um, do you need it for any video stuff or do you need it just for graphic or are you just kind of like browsing the internet? What are you doing? Okay, because you can browse the internet on a $300 computer, but if you're going to do video stuff, you actually need to kind of jump up. You need a better video card. You need a better sound card. You need this. You need that. Okay, cool. So we got the computer kind of sorted out. Um, it's a laptop. So you're going to be traveling with it or are you just using this to kind of like go back and forth to Starbucks? Because this is giving me key information. Okay, so if you're traveling with it, we got these really cool travel bags that don't just hold your 
you know, your laptop, they hold the rest of your business stuff and maybe a suit can fit in there or whatever, you know, the case may be. And so you kind of like the next logical thing in what is their kind of ultimate goal in achieving uh, or what was the next logical step in them achieving their goal? I love that. That's such a, that's some good, here's some good examples. And you know, this proves that it's not just a, a one case scenario. It's not only Best Buy. It's not only McDonald's. Aldo shoes is a, is a huge company. You know, tons of stores. Most malls have an Aldo. Do you know that Aldo also has a second store called Aldo accessory? Yes. Aldo accessory does not sell shoes. That's how valuable accessories are. Add-ons are. A whole store. They created an entire store. Not a shelf where you pick up your shoe goo. They have glittered masks when masks were mandatory that matched all their shoes. Earrings. The whole premise of the store, Claire's, is accessory products. They don't have a single product that you would go in there and match something with. It's all accessory based. They, they have a franchise on accessories. That's how successful accessories are. Success, that's how successful accessories are. Right? That's a moment. There's a time, there's a time <laughs> for you. you go, to, go on Amazon. Amazon has this nailed down too, and people don't even know it. They don't even recognize it. You buy your item. I bought a ring light so I could do my TikTok. Mm. Do you need people, a tripod with that? Do you need a lav mic with buy that? This, buy this product. Also commonly bought a tripod. Commonly bought this. And so you look and you're like, eh, okay, add. Because it's only 12 bucks. Who cares? It's only another $12 free shipping included when you, when you reach over $50. Guess what? I'm at 49 Boom, free shipping. And it was because of an add-on. And see, for Amazon to to go through that simple act of being like, oh, this also couples with this, like the next logical thing. And they got algorithms to do all of that. It's not a person, you know, sitting there clicking these things Um, for them to do that. They have nailed down their customer acquisition cost and they've nailed down what their lifetime value is and anything that they can do to increase that cart value while you're in that position of shopping is going to benefit them and their bottom line. And let's. I mean, let's not forget he's the richest guy in the world started this company on the back of selling books and buying Google AdWords, but they you didn't do any it. other advertising. They literally, they found their thing. They served people with that. And then, Oh, you buy books. What else can we sell? <laughs> but, but you nailed it there when you said, um, uh, what did you say? You just said it and it, it runs the whole add on premise. That Where the lifetime value of a customer increasing that value means you're need, increasing the business's potential to grow and serve more people. People need it. And if you don't believe it, see cart, it was cart revenue. That's what we're talking about. Increasing your cart value. Cart value is something that businesses need to focus on, whether you have a salesperson or not. Cart value is what will help you scale and system selling value adds that is part of your increasing your cart. You work at a restaurant, sell them the dessert, sell them the extra drink. That increases your cart value. It also increases your tip percentage. However, you need to identify that. But the other thing you need to do is everyone in the business, whether it be the person at the counter, the person answering the phone, your salesperson, your manager, whoever it is, they need to believe that it's required. They need to believe that it's work, that, that it's, going to help them. It's going to help the business. I worked with somebody who's extremely good at his job. He was a terrible salesman. And sometimes he had to go out and he had to sell. It was just kind of one of those things. It was last case scenario. End of the world is happening. So he'll go out and he'll help a customer. But he didn't believe in selling more expensive products. He didn't believe in selling anything extra than what they asked for. Guess what? He never sold anything extra. Because anytime someone, even when people asked, he would not offer them. Like they would say, oh, well, what about this? Oh, that's way expensive. You can get it cheaper somewhere else. And I had to like break it out of them. I'm like, dude, you can't, these are valuable products. Well, they're so expensive. No, 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 they're not. They're not expensive. It's just that you're too cheap to buy them. But they're not expensive. It's relative. Don't look at expensive. Don't make the decision for the customer that they can't afford this. 
That's actually not very fair. Not all customers are who they seem. And you know what? Let them decide. So when someone comes in to buy a $2,500 or $3,000 TV, offer them the sound system. You're going to know right away. The first response, no, I, I'm not, I'm, I, I only have the budget for the TV. You know what? Fair enough. If you ever looking to upgrade, come see me. I'll help you out. Okay. Super cool. Or, Hey, do you want a sound bar? Have you thought about that? I've thought about them. I just don't know much about them. Come with me, right? Let me educate you. Let me show you something. And then you can make a decision. I know it works because I bought a sound bar with a TV that I didn't want. Dude, you're reminding me of, uh, I saw a podcast with, um, I think it's Bradley. Yes. He was the, the talking about you're in my store. Yeah. Yeah. He was talking about, um, what, his days back when he was a car salesman and he goes, whenever somebody would walk in, we always, there's always a pressure. There's always pressure. It doesn't matter what happens. Somebody walks into a car dealership. You immediately feel like, like from a customer's perspective, you're like, I'm getting sold to, I'm getting tricked. I'm getting, you know what I mean? So him as a salesperson to very quickly and very efficiently break down that defense. Here's what he would say. He said, you don't need to, you don't need to buy today, do you? And the simple act of asking that question, just for a second, let that soak in. The simple act of asking, you don't need to buy today, do you? And most people are, no, nah, no, nah, I'm just kind of browsing. Okay, cool. That's great. Let's go take a look. And now there's no pressure anymore, right? And if somebody did like, you know, uh, it's an emergency. I need a van and I need it today. Guess what? That dude's making a sale and it's happening right now. <laughs> you, you know, you get a gauge of, um, you know, where that customer is at in their purchase decision-making process, um, especially if somebody's just browsing. Okay, cool. Let me be the guy that you remember so that while you continue browsing, there's a reason for you to come back to me because sure, maybe not right now I'm going to make this sale, but I ain't even worried about that because I make tons of sales. And the so, reason is because you establish that trust right away by breaking down those barriers between you and that person you're trying to serve. Bradley in that same, uh, in that same little clip, he made it, he made a comment that's really applicable in retail, but applicable everywhere. But one of the things he said was um, when you say, Oh, can I help you with anything? Right. Cause that's, that's engagement. That's important. You want to greet the customer. Um, but sometimes you can stifle yourself by saying that. Right. Can I help you with anything? That's a yes or no question. Stop saying yes or no questions because customers will say no, even though they want to say yes, but they'll say no. So this is, this is a typical scenario. You go into like a, I don't know, warehouse one or something like that. Jean store. Let's go back to bootlegger. Can I help you with anything? How are you doing today? Uh, I'm just browsing. Cool. End of well, that's a buzz kill. <laughs> right. But you as the salesperson should actually finish that sentence either verbally or quietly, depending on how tactful you are. No, I'm just browsing in your store. Oh, I'm just browsing for your product. Oh, I'm just browsing. That's not the end of the conversation, but if you allow it to be, that's not an, they didn't say no. Right. Oh, I'm just browsing. Perfect. What are you browsing for? You shopping for someone else or are you shopping for you? Uh, 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 somebody else. Cool. So it's a gift. Now the conversation is going and you're engaging and you're creating a bit of a, you know, a comfort zone that they can kind of connect with you with, but don't, don't allow it. Say no. And don't ask a question where they can say no. And this isn't about pressure cells. This is about getting to know your customer, your client. This is about offering value. You might be a valuable person. You have valuable products. You can set them up with exactly what they came to your store to do. But if you let them say no, they're going to go to the next store too. Right, right? right. But you have to put them at ease. So that, that, saying, hey, you don't have to buy today to you. What that does is it, it breaks down that barrier. So someone comes in, a, a great conversation starter is, hey, how are you doing today? Good, thanks. Cool. Just to let you know, there's a couple things going on in the store. Don't want you to feel lost or confused. Well, here's what we got over here. And, you know, and never say, and if you need anything, let me know. Let me know. I'll be off on my phone. Let me know. I'll be off not serving you. Let yeah. me know. I'll be off not bringing you any value. Stop saying that. Be there. Kill you right away. Yeah. So what good is having an anchor client 
what good is having value adds and putting all the time and effort to putting that together to have somebody to say, if you need anything, let me know. No, they do need something. They're in your flipping store. They're there because they want to know what you have. They want to know if there's value that it can bring to them. Bring the value to them. People yeah. love spending money. And if you're unclear on this, uh, I remember um, Dot Com Secrets, I think I read. It was Russell Brunson's book. This is way, way, way back, 2008, I think it was. Um, he talked about establishing your value ladder. So knowing what's at the bottom of the barrel of the cheapest stuff, not necessarily the cheapest. I mean, the, just the, the least costly things that you have to offer knowing what those are and what's the high ticket stuff what's really really expensive and the objective now is is to start people with those lower figures and move them up to the bigger ones if they're a fit that doesn't mean pressuring somebody to buy something that's too expensive or outside of their means because that's uh that's shady and unethical but it does mean that if somebody comes in um to the store and let's say they're looking for some pants Okay, so let's start them there with the pants. Let's just say that's the lowest value thing. High value or the high ticket item is a jacket, right? Pants are 50 bucks in most cases. Jackets are 200. Okay, so we start here. As we go, you can throw in, okay, do do you you need a jacket with this? Because I don't know, you know, it's kind of chilly out or whatever. The seasons are changing or whatever. However you introduce that idea to them, now they're pondering it. And maybe 1% of the people go for that jacket. Uh, you know what? No, I don't need jackets. That's I'm good. Okay. But do you need, you need socks or anything like that? Like, I just want to make sure that you look fly when you leave here. It's important to me that you look good when you leave. So what else can we, what else can we do? Is it just the pants or is there anything else that we can add on? But you start back up at that high when you kind of like work your way back down and that's all inside of your value ladder. But if you don't even know what the value ladder is, you're dead in the water. See, the one thing I disagree with there is starting low. Ah, I, I, yes, yes. It's, it's easier to come down than go up because you could come in and say, let's talk about jeans and you show someone a $10 pair of jeans and they may think in their mind, you know, for 10 bucks, that's a pretty wicked deal, right? Like they're decent jeans for a $10 pair of jeans. I came in here with a budget of 70, but. And then they may even go with the 20 or $30 jeans, but they, they were willing to spend the $70. So you left $50 on the table. Right. Well, you got to have your finger on the pulse of the person that you're talking about too, right? It's true. So but when they but come in there asking for the jeans, you got to find, okay, what is it then? Where are you on the, but that's now where, you, I start know where you are. Right. If you start high, very few people go out and buy a $250 pair of diesel jeans. Right. 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 I did. (laughs) That's why I said 50 bucks because that's like the most I spend on pants. I did, but it was because of a salesperson. Right. Right. And it wasn't because of pressure. It was because I was like so blown away. I'm like, I got it. Was it because she was a pretty lady and she told you you look good in them jeans? No. (laughs) Yes to the first part. No, no to the looking good in the jeans. I do look good in the jeans, but that's not what she said. But anyway, (laughs) but if you start someone at, at something unrealistic, Right? Why does a showroom in a dealership not have the, the entry level car? They've got the one fully loaded. It's not because everyone's going to buy it. So you, you show someone the $300 pair of jeans and probably it's going to be too expensive for them. And you're like, you know, these ones are $300, but they're extremely good. And everyone's like, yeah, it's good. It's just a little bit too much. You know what? Fair enough. That's even too much. Like I probably couldn't afford these either. Um, these ones over here, really good value. They're 150. So like half the price, right? 150, but still that's a, you know, a higher priced pair of jeans. And they're like, oh, that's better. But it's just, you know, I was kind of hoping for somewhere in the 80 mark. You know what? Perfect. Let's bring this down. This one's 85. Yep. Perfect. So now you've maxed out the budget that they're comfortable with without leaving any money on the table. Or you could say, okay, so in your mind, so $80 on jeans, you ask them. So if you were going to pay $80 in jeans, were you planning on picking up like a, a shirt or a pair of socks or anything like that? I was thinking about it. Would that is that on top of the 80? Because we've got like some two for ones right now. We've got some really good deals. Now I only have 80 bucks. Can you tell you what? Let's go down one. We'll go to the $60 pair of jeans, get you something that looks really good, and we'll keep this, we'll throw enough in so you can walk out with a full outfit. You see how coming coming down that way, you've now added value to them. You've done you've added a system, you've given them more value for their money. And you've maximized your revenue because that t-shirt, you made more money than you did on your jeans. 
And you know, I'm noticing too, it just is in that exact example. There is an implied compliment that comes along with, we have these $300 jeans. Because I think that you would be a $300 jeans guy. And I'm like, oh, so you think I'm a $300 jeans guy? That's cool. Right? I mean, not maybe not all people kind of take that, but the, but there might be a, a subliminal compliment that's going in inside of that. And then when, you, when you're genuine in that interaction and going, okay, listen, then what's the number? Let's find the thing that you're looking for. So at least we kind of reach something, but, you know, starting at that point gives them um, the, uh, I don't know, it just implies this idea that you think that they're an important person worth serving and worth going above and beyond for. Do you remember the TV commercial? It was a, um, a guy sitting in a Formula One race car and he's revving the engine and the salesman standing over him. And this guy's revving the engine. He's just like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, man, that feels good. I vaguely remember this. Like, no, and the salesman goes, yeah, you like that? Nice, eh? He goes, yeah, yeah. How much? And he goes, I don't know, it was like 2.3 million. <laughs> and he, he looks at the cut it looks at the guy in the car and the guy in the car looks down like he's actually contemplating it right because he doesn't want to say he can't afford it yeah so he goes oh yeah so does it come in blue and the salesman's like no he's like ah yeah and then and then it goes into an ad about a car and then it shows him and this and his wife driving away in an suv dude was that the honda like maybe it was a honda minivan or something like that <laughs> yes i remember this Genius. But it's such a classic example. It's like the salesman, and and yes, it's it's all staged, but this is a real situation. The salesman looks at him and he doesn't go, Oh, this guy can't afford, you know, a two million dollar car. So let's just and and judges what he can or can't afford because technically he might assume that maybe this guy can't afford a two million dollar car because most of us can't afford a two million dollar car, but he never made him feel like he couldn't afford it. He didn't right. say how much, he didn't say, Oh, it's out of your price league. He just told him straight up, "That's how much it is," and left it with his court. When it came, when it comes to sales and negotiating, I, I know I'm kind of off a little bit here, but keep this rule in mind: He who speaks last loses. When you say a price, shut up, because Be the next person it. that talks loses the negotiation. If you set a price on the table. And then you speak next, you're justifying, you're defending a price. Be confident in it. It is or it isn't. Because when that person speaks, and it can get awkward, you got to have some confidence to do this. But if you have a 10, 15, 30 second quiet, and you just... It's hard to be quiet, man. It's hard to shut up, but I'm telling you, do it. Shut your mouth. And when the customer looks at it and makes a comment, now you're back in the power seat because they broke. You broke them. So it's it, it's an interesting one and it's very hard to do. And I've seen guys not have the ability to do it because they talk so much. Right. right? They, they that don't idea of qualifying yourself like it's, oh, you know, you have to defend the thing that's happening. That uh, idea is actually backwards. And this is crazy. Um, I think it's called Never Split the Difference. Chris Voss, he's a genius. Uh, 20 years as an FBI negotiator. Um, he flipped the script on people. So when you, when you ask, uh, or when you say like, um, Oh, it's this much or whatever. The idea here is to get them to do the legwork now. So when, when they're, when they're asking you like, Oh, you know, how good are you compared to your competitors? The, the idea that you have to sit there now, most people's instincts are be like, Oh, well, we're like this much different. And we do this different. We do this different. But if you flip that around on them, you go, well, why did you consider us? You're going to get them to start selling to you. They're going to be in a position now to go, well, you know, you looked like you guys had good pricing. I seen you got four, four and a half star ratings. Um, seems like you guys are doing really, really well. Yeah. Okay. Well, then you come to the right place because that's exactly the place that we are. And now you don't have to defend anything. You, you've let them open that door to them being in the position of building you up. And when all is said and done, they're still going to feel good about making that purchase decision because the whole time you've allowed them to sell themselves. So you don't really even have to do anything. And that stems back to the idea of like, you know, just drop it and leave it. You say the thing that you need to say and then let it be quiet. And the more confident and cool, calm, collect you are in that very, very awkward pause, 
whether it's one second that feels like an eternity or two minutes that feels like an eternity, the end result is, is still going to be a benefit to you and to the person that you're serving, right? We, we live in a culture right now where most people are in debt. And you know why? It's because they impulse buy. So I never feel bad about selling someone something if I believe that it was had value, right? They had the opportunity to say no, but they didn't. So that's up to them. That uh, I'm not going to take that away from them. So when you're selling something, price and any language around price, whether it be uh, sale, expensive, deal, out the window. Do not be the one to bring that up. Bring value. So when someone's looking at TVs and you're working the TV section, what are you looking for? I'm looking for a TV. Okay, well, now we've established that. You're in the TV section. You're in the right place. So that's good. Uh, <laughs> what's right? Like, But that's that's the ridiculousness of introducing. But it, you can make a joke of it, make light of it. And guess what? Now you've made that connection. But if, if you're not a kind of funny, witty person, then you just come up with something around that. But okay, so they're in the TV section. They're in the market for a TV. Perfect. I'm your guy. What size the TV? If you ask what's your budget or you say, you know, what's your price range? Well, now you're just limiting, right? Because maybe they're not going to be happy with what they go home with. So say, what size of TV are you looking for? Oh, I'm, I just bought this new thing and I can put a 65 in it. Okay. So 65, like you're good with that. Cause I'm not going to show you anything bigger. You, know, you can't come back on me and, and regret your purchase, your purchase, right? They've already bought the product from you in this conversation. No, I can max out at 65. So I'm good. Perfect. How th- are you looking for like a thin screen? You're looking for something a little bigger. Cause I mean that there's lots of processing power. What do you watch? Do you watch movies? Are you a gamer? Like what's going on? What's, what's your life like? Right. Oh, th- so all these facts, man. Okay. I got the perfect TV for you. And it's all meets all your criteria. Yeah. It's this one right here. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. How much is it? Uh, sticker says, like it's right there. You don't got to ask me. It's right there. Right? It's $3,500. Okay. Next person to talk loses. <laughs> you know, I instinctually had like, I was like, oh, I got to say something. <laughs> right? And that person goes, ah, there, I was kind of hoping to spend 25. Good to know. Okay. That's, that's good. This is what this met all your criteria. You watch the housing shows like TLC and House Hunters and all that. They always mm-hmm. show someone more expensive than their budget because it meets all their needs. And so it sets a realize, realistic expectation to say, if you want to meet all your needs, you got to spend 3500 bucks. I'm not going to give you this TV for free. Right. But to meet your budget, let's meet halfway. You're going to have to sacrifice a couple things, but we can meet your budget. So what's more important? Ah, you know what? I don't want to regret it. That it does. It meets all my needs. Let's spend the extra little bit of money and I'll go there. Boom. Done. If I had led with price, I wouldn't even have showed you the $3,500 one. And I would have left a thousand dollars on the table. Yeah. Who loses? Right? Both of you. You don't get the, the sale. The business doesn't get the money and the person doesn't go home happy. They go right? home disappointed because they got something that they didn't really want. That wasn't a pressure sale. That was right. a value add sale. Well, right. and that's a that that just points at digging into, you know, the line of questioning, the way that you're, you know, interacting with that person. Uh, I can't remember where this one came from. I think it was persuasion. So there was a security uh, security system door to door salesman, and he would go door to door knocking on doors, and he had the same spiel as everybody else did. But for whatever reason, they couldn't figure this out. He he was closing at like let's say twenty percent more than anybody else, or fifteen percent more, or something like that. So they they shadowed him, acted like oh he's uh, uh, you know this guy's here. I'm training him. Don't worry about him. Whatever, right? So he goes into the house. And he starts the conversation, gets things going, and it's exact same textbook. But there's a moment where he feigns some realization that, ah, shit, I forgot my next resource in my van. Do you mind if I just run out and grab it and let myself back in? And of course, Homer's, yeah, 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 sure, no problem. And off he goes. 
He goes, he grabs his binder. He comes back in. He oh, sits back down at the table and yeah, he continues the presentation. hundred percent textbook. Every single other thing happens exactly the same, except for this one thing. And you know what? Who do you let go in and out of your house at will? People you trust. So this simple act of just being like, hey, I forgot something. Can I let myself in and back out? That's all it took for that person, that family, that whatever, to trust him enough to go, yeah, this is a guy that I can trust to buy a security system from. And so it's just those 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 little things that you do to um, engage with the person in a, in a meaningful way, but also to influence them to believe that you are a trustworthy person. Now, obviously, this can be used for nefarious things, and we don't encourage that. Uh, but the idea that you can establish that trust through the way that you communicate with people in those conversations, especially in that line of questioning, like you're saying, okay, what do you need? What size, you know, is color important? Do you need this? Do you need that? Okay. This is the perfect fit. Right. And this, I guess this is a really great, great way to, to kind of like wrap things up here. Um, because now you're in a position to close the sale. So when you're shifting gears from, okay, everything meets the criteria let's close the sale. This is where so many people get super awkward and they don't know what to do. Like you said, uh, drop the price and then don't say anything and let the person finish the rest of the transaction. And that's a, that's one really, really solid way to do that. Um, I'm curious to know, are there other um, strategies that you use or other tidbits that somebody could pick up here that would help them in that, you know, that, those, those final stages of, of kind of wrapping up the deal. Um. I always viewed that if it, if it took that last ask, you've kind of already lost, um, an effective sales, you've already sold it before the conversation's over. And so, yes, there's, there's that hard close sometimes where it's like, Hey, all right, ready to sign on the dotted line. That shouldn't be when you get the indication, there should already be that comfort level of like, this is just going kind of a cheeky little you know, say, Hey, time's up. Let's make a decision. Right. Uh, or, or, you know, phoning somebody up and be like, what'd you think of the quote? You should already have a pretty good gauge of where that is and enough of a reputation. So I'm not saying that that's all the time. Yes. At the end, you definitely should know, but something I always did, uh, cause funny enough, I did, I did security systems door to door. So nice. I know the security system world very well. <laughs> and one of the things is that I found successful in closing deals Yes, the trust factor, absolutely. You're talking about safety and security. Trust is a huge thing. They have to like you. If they don't like you, they're not going to buy it from you. But overcoming objections, and that, that probably will be another op- uh, podcast, but if you can overcome objections in a tactful, respectful, and educational way, you can a lot of times close the deal before you pull out the paperwork. So for example, uh, quickly, you could say, um, you know, every house needs protection. Ah, oh, I got my dog, right? I got my Rottweilers. Rah, 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 rah. I don't need a security system. I have all this in place. You know what? That's awesome. I protect that too. <laughs> you know how many dogs die because of break-ins? You know how many dogs die because of fires? A dog's not going to put your fire out. You're going to lose your dog. Do you love your dog? I know you do. Let's protect your dog so that when you're gone, you know that if something's wrong at your house, because it's monitored. Oh, guess what? A burglar comes in and shoots your dog. Let's protect your dog. Don't use him as an objection. I'm here to bring value to you and everything you love. And by doing that tactfully, you know, I had to learn this the hard way because sometimes I'm just a jerk, but it's like, you bring that tactful. And when they think about it, you've educated them on something thinking over like, oh, I always viewed my dog as my security system when really it's just an alarm, right? He's, he's not everything that maybe I just said he was. Okay, I got to take this more seriously. Okay, let's talk, right? And then you can close, you closing that deal. So the, the deal didn't get closed when I said, do you want to buy from me, right? That's not closing the deal. So I think closing the deal is that's another conversation, but it's, it's much bigger than the end of the transaction. Right. 
right? And, and that's I think where it boils that down to that path. simple. There's just again, it's just a line of questioning that, very, that near the end of a sale, or you know, when you kind of feel things are kind yes. of coming to a close, it's like, okay, so let's just go down the checklist real quick. We've met this criteria, this criteria, this criteria, this criteria. Um, seems like this is a good fit. So uh, you know, let's move on to the paperwork. And yeah. just like you said, tactfully doing that respectfully, doing it in a way that it feels like it's a smooth transition. Cause being the salesperson, you are kind of leading that energy, right? Like you're, you're yeah. the one leading the way. And when you make it easy for somebody to follow you because they know, like, and trust you, um, getting to that position, you should, like you said, you should have already known that. And then when it comes to dealing with, uh, objections, like, oh, you know, I got to think about it or, um, I got to talk to the wife or, you know, th- like somebody's always going to have something there. Uh, and, and that's always been, at least for me, and I'm sure for lots of other salespeople, that's been the hardest place, um, or the hardest hurdle to get over is like, Oh, I got to think about it. Mm-hmm. Well, I thought we and, just did that. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Like, I thought we just went through that. There's so what things else to overcome left? that. And, and, you know, a lot of people use that as those as objections, like, mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, quickly here. Someone goes, oh, you know, I got to talk to the boss. I got to talk to the old lady, you know, and they throw that out there. And so what I used to do was I was like, you're in here. You have basically wasted my time. You know, sorry to sound like a jerk, but you have. I'm trying to make an income. I'm trying to make a living here. So I would just ask them straight out. And it, it never came across as rude, but it was always like, you know, you'd think by now you wouldn't come in without her. <laughs> and and they would look at me and I'd be like, because now you're just going to have to, like, I hope you remembered what I said, because now you're going to have to teach her or bring her in and me and her can just make the decisions. Right. And right away, they would be like, well, I make decisions. Really? Because he just told me you didn't. Right. And so I'd almost pull on that ego string. Mm-hmm. But if it was legit and it's like, we don't make decisions without each other. Okay. You know what? Make you a deal. Bring her in we will have a discussion and she will love me. I promise you that. Right. But those are objections that people stop at. So when you, when you overcome those objections, you're more likely and don't remember less is more, the less you talk, the better the customer will relate to you. People just want to be heard. Right. Like, that's the thing is like, when I, when I will go, I want to go buy a car or something like that. Like, I don't want to just be told what I want. I want what I want to be heard and then addressed and then fixed. And, you know, the line of questioning, we've kind of like, we've already unraveled that, but un- going back to, oh, I got to talk to the boss. There's an easy way to overcome that object- obje- objection. And that is establishing from the very beginning that the person you're talking to is the one that's going to be making the decision. And that comes from right at the very beginning, asking those lines of questioning. So is it you that has to make the decision here? Are there other people that need to be involved? Um, I'm just saying that because, you know, I got to go and tell you all the stuff that I need to tell you. And if, you know, another person's here uh, or another person needs to be here, I'd rather them just be here so that we can get that taken care of. Right. Or the I got to think about it, people. The I got to think about it, people, um, I think are probably some of the easier ones to overcome uh, just because it it boils down to a very, very simple question. It starts like this. In in my experience, um, there are two kinds of people that say, I need to think about it. The first kind is um, the ones that are very polite. They don't want to upset me. They don't want me to feel like they've wasted my time, but they're not going to be buying from me and they're going to go out the door. It's adios amigo and we're we're never going to speak again. The other group of people are the ones that are just missing the right information to make this decision. And so I'm curious to find out which one you are. Oh, well, I'm not the polite guy, uh, or maybe I am. You know what? Listen, I, I really just don't want it. It takes the pressure off of that person. and They can, they can just come right out and say that thing. Um, but on the flip side, well, okay, so my wife is probably going to ask about the financing. How long is the financing or how much do I got to pay? What are the hidden costs? Because our budget's tight and we got to make sure that we make this decision. Okay, cool. I can arm you with the right information so that you can make sure that the decision that you make right now isn't going to get you into trouble later. And isn't that my job, right? Because I'm here to work with you to help you achieve that thing. But it's to confront that thing head on and do it in a way that's compassionate and empathetic, right? Because I get it. Being in that position where you're just being polite and you, you know you don't really know how to say no or establish boundaries or any of that other shit, 
it's really easy to just be like, I got to think about it. That's an easy way out. So if that's, if you're that person, then I'm cool. I don't, I don't need to spend any more time with you. I appreciate the time you've given me off, off we go. Yeah. And sometimes that creates just that uh, commonality. It creates referrals, right? If you've put them at ease, they're going to tell someone else to go to you. It just wasn't for them. You, you didn't create an enemy. So I think, I think this episode was actually really productive because whether you're a small business without a sales team or you have a sales team, the principles are the same, right? You build that anchor. You find the anchor both in your service and products and your clients. You find systems where you can increase cart value. And you focus on potential objections for your market and your you know, customer client demographic and that you find a way to tactfully overcome them and keep yourself in the driver's seat of the transaction or the sale all the time. And if you do those, yeah, it's easier said than done. Absolutely. And that's why we keep doing this and we keep helping people. But those are things that if any of those are missing, you're missing out on cart value. So which, keep working which is on it. hinder your business. You're not going to be able to grow. Absolutely. You're not going to be able to help more people, which isn't that why you're in business to begin with. Like, and sure, there's a lot of perks. I can set my own schedule. I can make a lot of money and, you know, go on vacation whenever I want. I'm my own boss and all that other stuff. But like at the end of the day, um, I, I genuinely believe that us just as human, it's, it's in our human nature to want to help other people to achieve their goals, whatever those goals are. So if, if you're in a position where you're selling something you don't believe is helping somebody, but you know that sales is where you want to be, then maybe that speaks to you shifting, you know, the role that you're playing or where you're playing that role or what you're doing. And you know, how that can um, transform into you living out that purposeful uh, life. So I th- I'm just, I'm putting this out there, like anyone who wants, I've, I've got the sales drive course, but I mean, at the same time, I'm, I'm here to help people. So if you're in a sales position or your business needs some sales, you know, advice or help, reach out, uh, you know, our contact info is on, on all our pages, right? Yep. Perfect. Um, so if you're watching this or uh, streaming it, wherever, leave a life, uh, like leave a comment, um, share this with somebody who needs to know it. And, uh, if, if you are just listening to the audio, leaving a review really, really helps the podcast reach more people. So if you think that there's value here, um, for other people to find, then, uh, then you can do that and it'll help out big time. If you want to get in touch with us, like Mitch said, our, our contact information is everywhere, but just for the record, you can email us at email the perspective at gmail.com for now. That's a wrap. And we will see you guys in the next episode.